Today we uh, declare, we proclaim, we celebrate the, uh, that Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, came back to life. That he rose, or he is risen, or he is resurrected. He is alive. And that after being assuredly dead and buried. Uh, there was a, a thing for a while that was, was, went around called the swoon theory, that he just kind of was in a deep coma and he popped out of it. But that's clearly not the message of Scripture. In fact, it, 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 Scriptures make pains to tell us that when he was crucified, it was done by professional executioners, Roman soldiers uh, who were used to doing this, who did this a lot. This was the, the big way that Romans discouraged any kind of um, re rebellion or revolution against themselves by making examples of people in this horrid, horrible way. And uh, so they were professional, and when asked by the governor, Pilate, if he was dead, he said, yeah, he's already dead. And uh, so th they gave that testimony. So the implications of the resurrection are many, there are many, many implications. We're just going to look at first at three, okay? We'll look at three of them. Fairly quickly, too, for me. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead means, okay, one, he is unique among humans. He came back to life after he's dead. That's unique. Doesn't happen, right? We don't see that. It's, we're not watching it. We're not observing it in the, in the human race. It just doesn't happen. So this is something that's terribly unique. And therefore, his death, this reflects back to the meaning of his death. His death has profound significance. So uh, everybody dies. Many people were crucified. But the thing that, that pop makes this, this particular death, this particular crucifixion pop out is that after three days he came back to life. So you can't, you can't uh, divide these two. Uh, they, they go together. It makes sense that there was some significance to his death, that he died for our sins and we can be forgiven through him. So, so the resurrection takes us back to that very fundamental point that Christ died for us. So when this scripture we just read, Paul puts it all together. So this is... Uh, uh, in chapter 15 of First Corinthians. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is the core thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So he puts these three things together. He died for our sins, he was buried, and then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So he's saying not only, and then he goes on to talk about how they were witnesses of these things, but that these things were, were talked about beforehand in the scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. In other words, they were prophesied or predicted and in other ways kind of uh, demonstrated through, through events that happened through the, through the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, so, so there it is. Uh, so that's, that's point one. And so it's a, it's a package deal. The cross and the resurrection go together, which is kind of how we, we kind of view Easter, the, our Easter weekend. So that's, that's point one. Point two. In some cosmic sense, Jesus has conquered death, period. And therefore, he will never die again, and he has opened the way for all of us to live forever. So, so he's, he's, he's brought to us immortality. Later on in this chapter, he, he, Paul writes, the mortal will put on immortality, this perishable must put on the imperishable. Then will come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory all as on account of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, John, in, uh, John tells us in the book of Revelation, so one of the things you may not realize, the book of Revelation has, has a bunch of the words of Jesus in it. So, I mean, we have the, the kind of the teachings, the words of Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there's also some words of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And one of the things that Jesus says is, I have the keys of death. I have the keys of death and Hades. I open and no one shuts, and I shut and no one opens, right? So he has conquered death. Three, so that those, th those two are pretty big to, to Christians at least, and fairly well known. That, you know, it, it has an implication back to the cross that means he died for our sins. Two, that we can live forever. <laughs> and he opened, the, he opened the gates of heaven and uh, brought immortality to, to light. He, here's one that's a little less known but super important. Three, he has begun the remaking of all creation. When Jesus stepped out of the tomb, or actually when Jesus rose from the grave and then stepped out of the tomb, he was the first step in God's plan to recreate things. Um, the Apostle Peter, decades later, calls this, this new creation a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
So God has a plan to kind of redo his creation. The creation's kind of messed up, it's broken, it's, it's corrupted, and God will redo it. And, it, and there will be a, a, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, according to the scriptures. So that's kind of over against. Many of us were taught as kids, or you know, in our churches, that when you die, I mean, Christ died for us, therefore we can hope and uh, we have a hope of everlasting life. So when we die, we float off up into the ether somewhere. <laughs> we're not sure heaven, okay? And we kind of maybe be on a cloud somewhere and just forever and ever, we're kind of this disembodied being which is not the scriptural teaching. The scriptural teaching is quite different. It actually says that we will be embodied beings, that we will be resurrected as Christ was. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature, a new creation. So we're we're actually the beginning. If you're you're in Christ, Christ is in you. You you uh, You are a harbinger of the creation that is to come. So kind of like the robin that, if you're seeing any robins, not maybe this morning, one of the guys in, in Inglesby said, you know, God really has a sense of humor. This is definitely an April Fool's joke, this freezing you know, Christmas at Easter or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so but, but the robins that are hopping, on, they're hopping around the yard, they're harbingers of spring, right? And in like manner, Christians who are hopping around, Christians who have the life of Christ, the risen Christ within us, we are harbingers of the world to come and of... Uh, uh, of a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, so just to review, because these are, these are the three I want you to lock in your brain, for starters. One, you know, it, it, it means his, the cross was worth something. Our sins are forgiven through the cross of Christ because of the resurrection. Two, we can live forever. We, we can, we, we, we are, uh, this mortal will put on immortality. And three, uh, he has begun the remaking of creation the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So clearly this is, uh, this is core Christian belief. This is, Paul says, uh, I received and passed on to you as of first importance. And, you know, it's, it's very, it's kind of the simple core of the, of the Christian faith, Christian belief. Paul, writing in, the, in his, his letter to the Romans says, I think it's Romans 10, but I didn't look it up, but I believe it is. He says, he says this, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, you will be rescued, you will be delivered. For, he says, we believe with our hearts, and so we are justified. And we confess with our lips, and so we are saved. So these two, these two things are kind of central to, you know, if someone says, what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who confesses with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead. So that's pretty, pretty central, right? Now, of course, not everybody buys this, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and in fact, to many, it's ridiculous I mean, that somebody came back to life. That's quite the interesting mythology you guys have got going on there. And, and that's, that's a common perception in our world. And I'm going to tell you about it in a minute. In fact, so, so when Paul talks about the gospel in, in 1 Corinthians, I guess, he says, he says, uh, this gospel, he's actually talking about the cross of Christ, but it actually applies to this whole thing. He says, uh, it's, it's a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Foolishness. It's folly. So if you believe this stuff, you are an April fool. <laughs> so, it, yeah, April Fool's Day. So uh, I, I listened to a presentation uh, on YouTube by the British Humanist Association. The British Humanist Association. Association. Now, the humanists are generally, it's kind of almost, it's a philosophical perception on the way things are. Uh, humanists are generally uh, those who believe, they're naturalists. So, so they think everything can be, is explicable by natural means. They exclude anything supernatural in their belief system. And this, this was actually presented uh, on, in the YouTube. It's, it's, it's read or narrated by Stephen Fry. Some of you know Stephen Fry? You guys, I'm sure know. So, for, so Stephen Fry, um, uh, Greg, Greg uh, what, what's his name? Greg, Lo- Greg Laurie was the guy that played the doctor in House, okay? Remember Greg Laurie? He's actually a Brit <laughs> who, who does a perfect American accent. So, <laughs> so but, and Laurie and Fry were a comedic uh, couple or, or pair in Britain for years. So they, they had a whole show and, and shtick they did. Uh, so he's a well-known comedian, uh, this uh, uh, Stephen Fry, but uh, so he narrates this. So if you, you want to look it up, it's it's quite interesting, 
And uh, this is how it goes. This is how it goes. A part of it. This is how part of it goes. What should we think about death? One thing that we can be sure of is that we will die. Everybody will. Some people do not like the thought of this and don't accept it. They prefer to think that death is not the end of us, but that we might live on, perhaps in another life on earth or in another place where people are rewarded or punished. But wanting something to be true is not the same as it being true. And there is no evidence to support the idea that our minds could survive the end of our bodies. See the natural idea, humanist? What sense could we make of the things that we value? Love, experiences, communication, achievements, the warmth of the sun on our face, if we were disembodied? And if life were eternal, wouldn't it lose much of what gives it shape, structure, meaning, and purpose? So on. And he says in there, death is a natural part of life. So I, I hardly know where to start with that. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds right, sort of. And it's got truth intermingled in it, of course. Uh, but uh, it's got many things which I, 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 I disagree with. So it represents a view which is very current, very popular, and very appealing. But it's also very opposed to the Christian perspective <laughs> and to Christian belief. So, for instance, I'm just going to take a, a, a look at a couple of things. Some people do not like the thought of this, that everybody will die, and don't accept it. They prefer to think that death is not the end of us, but that we might live on, perhaps in another life on earth, etc. Well, you know, I, I felt like a little bit misrepresented by that comment. <laughs> because, you know, I think most people, Christians included, accept the reality of death. I don't really know of too many people who try to deny it. It's, it's something that's going to happen, but, so it's, it's, not, it's not an either you, you accept the reality of death or, you know, you, you, you believe you'll live on after. It's a both and. I, we accept the, the reality of death, but prefer to think that death is not the end of us. Right? So that's one, one point where I disagree. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he says, and there is no evidence to support the idea that our minds could survive the end of our bodies. There is no evidence to support the idea that our minds could survive the end of our bodies. Really? Actually, John, uh, uh, John Payne back here gave me a book that, that would argue otherwise. It's evidence and testimony of people that have basically died and come back. Uh, they've been resuscitated. Uh, their brains were, were carrying on. But uh, my thing is, there is evidence, the strong evidence, that the evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. He is the case in point. If that happened, then of course, it's not a problem that uh, minds can survive the ends of our bodies, right? So, so it, the, the, what he says does not follow. So uh, the point is, people may believe that dying is the end of us, that we just cease and it's all over and done with, but wanting something to be true is not the same as it being true. <laughs> so let's leave it at that. So a fourth point about the resurrection. And this is where I got my sermon title. It means that Easter is every day for the Christ follower. It's Easter every day for us. If you're a, a, also known as a Christian, a Christ follower. If Jesus is alive and he lives in us by his spirit, his resurrection life and power is what we experience. And we, we go around singing all this, you know, it's, uh, happiness is to know the Savior living life within his favor, you know. Uh, it's, it, this is the secret. It's Jesus in my heart. And we, we believe that and we experience. We experience the life of Christ inside us. But it's his resurrection life and power because he is risen. In Romans, Paul says this, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Romans 8.11 if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he, God, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the, the resurrection power and life of Jesus dwelling in us gives life to our physical dying bodies uh, you know, by the power of Christ's resurrection. That's what this is actually telling us. And what does that mean? Well, that... We have the power to rejoice in our trials. That's what we're doing all the time, right? <laughs> Love our enemies. Jesus calls us to that. Pray constantly. Find strength in our weakness. 
trust in the Lord through ups and downs and, and the, the difficulties of life, bring change to our world, expect and hope for immortality, uh, live fearlessly in many ways. Why? How? Because the spirit of the risen Christ is within us. So essentially, we are evidence of the resurrection. We who are followers of Christ, whose, whose resurrected life is in, working in and through us, and we're evidence that the resurrection was for, for real. We are walking evidence, and it's true. He is risen indeed. Shall we pray?